What do you think is the antidote to loneliness? South Africa has a new supermodel, Katrine Kruer. Around 15, I was scouted by a modeling agency. Modeling wasn't really ever something I thought of doing or even knew was a career, actually. People see something different in you. Like, you don't necessarily fit the typical model, like you said, box. Monday to Friday, I would be in school. On Fridays, I would get on the plane and head to Paris and shoot Vogue and then be back in school on Monday. I very quickly lost all my friends. I made some friends in the industry, but it's a very isolating career and industry. There was a lot of, a lot of tears. Many nights in New York, I was crying myself to sleep. Yet, I wouldn't change it. I would make the same decisions again. The value of friendship just meant so much to me because for so long I didn't have it. So I wanted to create a space where I knew other women would be able to connect with others. With unique circumstances and unique experience comes loneliness. So initially I was like, no, I came out of it fine. She did not. Katrine. Marco, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I firmly believe that our childhood plays a big role in forming us into the people we become. Tell us a little bit about your childhood and what that looked like. How much time do we have? <laughs> about an hour and a half. Um, first of all, I agree absolutely. Um, I think it's such an interesting take, um, as I said to you previously, now that I'm a mother as well, how from such a young age you already shape your child. Um, so yeah, my own childhood, very typical African suburban, um, mom, dad, brother, younger brother, two dogs kind of thing. Went to um, Tigerberg High School and, oh, just back to typical Afrikaans thing, even had a grandfather who lived on a farm. You know, it's, it's as basic <laughs> as you can get. And a very happy childhood. We went to um, Hartenbos every December, camping, um, same. Mm -hmm. Also, love a sticky camping. Um, yeah, so very, very typical in that sense. And I suppose the wheels kind of came off. Well, not really, but around 15, I was scouted by a modeling agency. And again, growing up in a very sheltered, almost conservative um, household, modeling wasn't really ever something I thought of doing or even knew was a career actually. I was very um, driven at school and I loved playing netball and I had my friends like very nerd like if I can put myself in that box which I'm not a fan of boxes but anyway. So when I got scouted it was like whoa what is happening and it was kind of a big thing for myself and my parents to make way of like okay so what does this mean and uh, yeah but that I suppose that's a little bit later but childhood's Pretty, pretty normal, nothing really to write home about. Invite us into that next chapter, like being scouted. How did it happen? How quickly did it change? And what did that change look like? Yeah, so scouted, as I said, at 15 um, in a shopping mall, the very cliche um, model story, I suppose. <laughs> um, and at first, I didn't really make anything of it. So basically, this guy came up to my parents, like basically running. I was like, oh my word, your daughter's beautiful. And we were all like, well, this is weird. We didn't think much of it. And we went to go see his agency. And he was like, oh, okay, well, you know, we'll sign. But I, school was still my first priority. And um, I remember going to the agency that first time from, it was like right after school. So. I had a few badges for like netball and debate team, like I said, like proper, like very invested in my school. And I remember right after school, I was like running to all my friends, like give me your badges, give me your badges, I need to like look, I need to like look impressive, right? So I even had a badge for rugby, it's like, anyway, it's <laughs> fine. This green jacket, like school blazer was like heavy <laughs> with everyone else's badges. But um, went to go see the agency, signed, didn't think much of it. A few months later, my agent phones was like, listen, IMG Models um, is in Cape Town and they're scouting for what we call new faces, so new faces for the industry. And 
IMG Models is the biggest agency, modeling agency and talent agency in the world. And I was like, okay, cool, mm, can't come. I have netball practice. And my agent was like, babes, you need to go. Like, IMG is a big deal. So, phoned my dad. It's like, listen, you need to take me to this casting. Because remember, 15, so, okay. So, we rush home. I shower. I put on... And just, I'm, I'm painting you this picture just for context, how little I knew of the industry. Put on one of my Sunday school dresses, again, conservative Afrikaans family, um, a pair of sandals, and I showered and we jumped in the car and left to go to town. Now, I have extremely curly hair, and the thing with that is if it's wet and it just dries by itself, it gets bigger. So, like, the closer we come to Cape Town, the bigger the hair got, right? <laughs> and the bigger the hair, the closer to God kind of thing. <laughs> But it was massive, and I was in my Sunday like school dress, my sandals, like cool, ready to go. Went in to see the the agent from IMG in my absolutely not model attire because you're supposed to be wearing black, like black jeans and a black tank top and like high heels. So there was the, this line of all the other models who knew what they were doing, and then me showing up in my Sunday best. And they loved me, and they asked me to come see the agency in Paris. And that June school holiday, by then I was 16, my mom, dad, and I got on a plane and, and went to Paris. Absolutely no guarantee of anything, because you just go meet the team, and they cannot guarantee that you will be signed or anything. And they loved me and signed me, and I stayed for, I think, two or three weeks. My mom and dad stayed in, pa in Paris during that time as well. And then my third job ever, I shot there in Paris, and it was for Prada. And my idea of fashion was Woolworths. So <laughs> shooting Prada really did not register as this is a big thing at all. Um, but then when the images came out, it was like, yeah, kind of like a bomb exploded and my career just took off. And Monday to Friday, I would be in school. And then Fridays, I would get on the plane and head to Paris and shoot Vogue and then be back in school on a Monday. And um, yeah, so that was that was kind of how my career just yeah, exploded. And then by the end of that year, my agent, um, actually no, I shot the main product campaign as well. With Steven Mazal, which is the big, he's the biggest fashion photographer uh, in the industry. And I also worked my first show for Givenchy as an exclusive for, for Paris Fashion Week. And again, none of this really registered. I was like, oh, well, you know, cool. I'm now walking in Paris Fashion Week, but in a week's time, I'll be at Artembos. <laughs> so there was this whole like paradoxal um, polar experience of like, here I am in Paris doing high fashion stuff, but in my mind, I'm like two more weeks and I'll be at Hartenbos. Um, and end of that year, my agent's like, listen, the career you've had in six months, other girls dream of and work towards for like 10, 15 years. So what's the plan? I was like, no, I have no plan. My plan is, well, I knew I couldn't really continue going because I can't do both. You know, you either have to do one properly because at the moment it was really, was really struggling to do both. And as a family, we discussed and talked and prayed about it and eventually decided, okay, well, I'm going to leave school, finish grade 10 and started working full time as a model. So I left that January, um, it was 2011, no, 2012. And I left for, for Paris Fashion Week and did Paris Fashion Week and then did Fashion Week in all the other main cities. So it was like two months. And in two months' time, I walked like 60 shows, shot all the big campaigns um, like Dior, Oscar de la Renta, Prada. And again, what happened to me in less than a year, other girls worked towards for years. So... Yeah, that was how, how that all happened. And again, I just remember outside of shows, there's always bloggers and they're like, oh, who are you wearing? And you know, it's like part of the whole fashion world. And I was like, Woolworths. <laughs> so again, even though I was like in the thick of high fashion, I was still a Woolworths girl at heart, you know? Still am. Mm. Yeah. So and this is not sponsored by Woolworths, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm I wish it was. <laughs> how did that change you? How did the, how did the relationships change in terms of the relationship with yourself, the relationship with your school peers, and the relationship with your, your parents? 
I laugh because now I'm two years in therapy and it's all coming out of the woodwork now, right? So initially I was like, no, I came out of it fine. She did not. Um, school peers, obviously our world's changed way too much. I was suddenly traveling the world and, and worrying about finding my driver in a city I've never been before or being on set and working with people I've never met. Um, and they were back at school. So I very quickly lost all my friends. I made some friends in the industry, but it's a very isolating career and industry, really, because everyone travels so much. Um, so the people you do meet often, you're like, cool, I don't know when I'm seeing you again. So in the beginning, the first year, two years that I worked, I first of all worked crazy hours. Like on set, usually it's like, 15 hours, I would go from from studio to the airport, fly into the next job, and it will be like months of traveling that way. And again, I was 16, 17 years old, so my parents couldn't always travel with me because they both have full-time jobs. I have a younger brother, so a lot of it I did by myself. And traveling the world by myself, having to be a professional in an uh, industry I didn't really know or... And again, how at 16 do you advocate for yourself, right? Um, so I, I struggled a lot with loneliness and I also lost all my friends in that, in that time. Um, and the relationship with my parents also changed immensely because suddenly I was being an adult overseas and then I come home for a month or two and they were like, oh, well, your boyfriend, by the way, also met my, my now husband at that time. We constellated and then because it is a school night. I'm like, well, I'm not in school, am I? <laughs> um, so it, it changed dramatically everything, really. First of all, it wasn't what I envisioned for my life. Um, so now looking back, I realized that I had to go through almost like a mourning period for what I thought my life would have looked like. Um, I was sad a lot of the times. I was also anxious all the time. And now... I also realized I am just an anxious person, but I was very, yeah, it was a lot to process as a 16-year-old and trying to navigate. And also at 16, 17, you can't see the big picture as much because this was everything. And I was like, okay, cool. Well, now I gave up school. So now what's going to happen? What am I going to do one day when I am ugly? <laughs> you know? So it was a lot to, to try and navigate by myself. Um, and just to kind of give context, a year and a half in, I had full burnout. I then decided to take some time off, and I finished high school through correspondence, so I did my A's and A-levels through Cambridge University. And that made quite a big difference in me just taking time to almost advocate for myself a little bit, at least, because agents tell you where to be, what time, what to do, what to wear, what to say kind of thing. So taking time for myself was very important mentally, but also physically I was overworked. So, and again, that time also helped in, in with my relationship with my parents specifically. <clears throat> so I then got to kind of be a child at home again, and we were able to figure each other out a little bit um, and make the relationship work. It uh, wasn't perfect, um, but yeah, and we, we're still working on it. So again, as I said, now looking back, I'm not in the high fashion industry as much, but now I can see how much that shaped who I am today. I mean, we spoke briefly about how your childhood shapes your, your, um, who you are now as an adult, but I think we often then think of child maybe as like five, six year old, but again, at 16, you're still a child. And in a way I had to give up my childhood I mean, it was a choice, but it was still, I think it was a bigger sacrifice than I initially thought it was going to be. Um, so that did shape me immensely. I, I wouldn't be the person I am today, and there was a lot of, a lot of tears. Many nights in New York, I was crying myself to sleep. Yet, I wouldn't change it. I would make the same decisions again. You mentioned that uh, you had a very different picture of what your life um, could look like or, or should look like. What did that picture look like? I thought I was going to have the normal, very big quotation marks, normal um, 
Afrikaans life, finish high school, go to my matric farewell, and then go to Salambosh, study there, meet a guy, get married, have kids, and then die. You know, the usual. <laughs> so, like... Mm, Sounds fun. Yeah. Can't there's wait. some... <laughs> yeah, exactly. A few things in between. But that's kind of what I thought, and I was so content on... That is... I mean, that's where we all kind of assume our life's going to look like, because that is what we are exposed to in the circles we move. That is what everyone does. So suddenly the carpet was like pulled from under me, like, listen, nope, you're going another way. And I think that's a good thing to kind of challenge or be challenged by your own beliefs a little bit, because I believe that that is what my life should look like. But I would not be the person I am today. The opportunities I've had since um, meeting my husband and our relationship working. I, he's a few, quite a few years older than me, he's six years older, so I don't think our relationship would have stood the test of time if I continued on that normal path. But I was forced to grow up really quickly. And I was, I mean, there's the obvious stuff of like traveling the world and meeting interesting people and, 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 and. So yet, again, looking back, now I can see that. Um, and I think it's a it's a exercise of uh, I want to say perspective, which you can only often gain afterwards. As you're older, I think you practice being able to kind of like always imagine myself like zooming out slightly and trying to look at the bigger picture. But at 16, 17, 18, you're unable to do that. So for me, it was a very big deal having to let go of that's what it should have looked like. And even now, I, I often bump my head against what something should look like. But I've come into the practice of saying, well, should according to who? Um, yeah. So that kind of makes me think, what did, how, the conversation that you had with your parents, this guy approaches you in a more, um, you have this world of opportunity knocking at your door. Invite me into the kitchen table where you and your parents put all the facts on the table, your little brother, walking around there and 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 this is the discussion now like are you going to travel the world and see many places meet many people go on the runways be on magazines um versus stay in school finish your studies go into a, a s more standard direction what did that conversation look like in all honesty i cannot remember it at all and i I spoke to my therapist about this a while back, and I think a lot of that is, I often don't remember. So a family friend of ours sometimes would travel with me because they live in Ireland, so it was a little bit easier for her to hop on a plane to New York, you know, as one does, versus my parents having to take leave. Anyways, so whenever I meet up with Helen, um, she'll be like, oh, remember when we did this and this and this in New York, and we were running around doing that, and I'm like, no, you lie. And it's just like, no, serious, that's what happened. So I think as a trauma response, almost, there is so much I don't remember. I, I cannot invite you to the kitchen table discussion because for the life of me, I can't remember it. So I think I imagine it went something like knowing my parents and knowing myself. This happened for a reason. Surely it's worth pursuing. And all the stuff you mentioned, walking shows, being on the cover of magazines, shooting big campaigns, we had no guarantee. This is an industry where you have no guarantee of success. And what's also a little bit of a mind game is, even now, because I'm still working full time, is I also still don't have any guarantee of success. You go for castings and you have no idea whether you're gonna get the job or not. And it's 99% of the time it's based on stuff that's out of your control. So add that element to being 16, no, not knowing who you are, not knowing if you're gonna have success. It was, it was such a big decision and I really can't remember us having this discussion. And it is interesting that I, that I can't remember it. I think, again, I think it's a bit of a trauma response. Like, yeah. Do you feel that those years that you had in modeling, traveling across the world in that stage at a young age, um, what did you learn, what are the biggest lessons that you learned during that about yourself um, and the lessons that you thought at that age, being self-aware, that you thought that you have to keep this into you becoming a mom and, and a mature model in that, in that space? 
I want to say again, everything happens for a reason. But I want to add a little side note to that saying, I think it's a very privileged answer because not everyone can justify stuff happening to them, but everything happens for a reason. Okay, but that's a discussion for another day. <laughs> um, I, like I said, it all worked out in the end great, right? I had a very successful career. It wasn't just bad, I had amazing experiences and it shaped me. All of those things shaped me who I am today. And one of the biggest things that I've also learned is how to advocate for myself, which came quite like much later. And the importance of getting to know yourself, which m often only happens when you are able to spend time with yourself alone. And I did that by traveling the world. So when I was in a hotel room in the middle of somewhere, who knows, um, I didn't have anyone else to lean on. I had to look inwards for, okay, well, I need to be comfortable, first of all, to keep myself company, to not just, you know, rush around and grab my phone or watch Netflix, but to be okay with spending time on myself. And then also, what, what do I want out of life? Which again is such big questions to try and navigate at that young age, and it's still something I don't necessarily would have answers for now. But without those circumstances, I would not have asked those questions. So all of those things perhaps just prepared me to look at things a different way and not again just stick to what is normal because I didn't. And it's allowed me to, to look at it like, okay, so there are other ways of doing things and there are other ways of approaching things. And I even applied that in my career when I remember when I took some time off to finish high school, I did, went back and I tried to do Fashion Week again. So I went for Castings Plus Fashion Week, did, did Castings Plus shows, and I wasn't booking anything. And my agents called me in and they were like, well, we're not really sure why you aren't booking anything. Let's take your measurements. And I stood there in my underwear and they took my measurements and they're like, well, here's the thing, your centimeters aren't, you are slightly, you're not what you should be, right? It's a little bit over, so. We propose you stay and you lose some weight and then you join Fashion Week again two weeks later in Paris. And I just said, no, I'm not interested. You can book me a flight back to Cape Town right now. And so I had to learn to advocate for myself from a very young age. So that's, I think, one of the things that I took from that experience and made it my own in every season that I've now moved into, even now as a mom. I advocate for myself, but for Christian, my son, above anything else. And do you think that comes from your experience over there? And did you, because did you, what I'm hearing here and, and what I could see in your interviews as well, is that people see something different in you. Like, you don't necessarily fit the typical model, um, like you said, box in terms of how you think about stuff and how reflective you are and how emotionally intelligent you are. So d did you ever feel that you're different to the crowd at Fashion Week and the ladies that surrounded you? Mm -mm. No, not at all. I think there's a, a quite a warped idea of the industry and models specifically. I, I've met incredibly interesting people um, who, because they've traveled the world or are continuously e exposed in the good sense to people from different walks of life, they, like I said earlier, challenge, challenge ideas, they challenge concepts, values, um, the way they do things. And I think that's quite an important thing to do and that's another thing that, that I was, that's a blessing that I was able to do because of my career was, if I were to do again the normal thing, I would have just been surrounded to like mind, like with like-minded people, which is not always a good thing. You need to challenge yourself, challenge your ideas, challenge your values even, um, by chatting with people who've had different experiences, who have different beliefs, because from them you learn something, and from you they learn something. So I've never had any bad experiences, and I'm very lucky. I think my guardian angel is like probably still 
on holiday <laughs> after those first few years. But I was very lucky to, to really just be surrounded by interesting people and people who um, allowed me to see different views, different um, yeah, ways of doing things, which is such an important thing because you can only decide what you want or what you like by knowing what your options are. And yeah, don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Um, you s mentioned that you, you have been going to therapy and have learned quite a bit there. Um, would you mind sharing some of the stuff that, that you've experienced about yourself um, and that, come to the, that came to the forefront in, in the later years? So I'm a big fan of therapy, big, big, big fan. So just for context, I, because of COVID, I, my career completely came to a halt. I started my own business, which was exactly a year old when COVID happened and we went into lockdown. And modeling industry also completely, no one could travel, all the usual things everyone knows about, anyways. So a year, first year, basically, okay, if we can put COVID into two years, right? That first year, we were still like, okay, well, it's only, what, how long was our first like, official? Six it was going to be, think it was yeah, but initially it wasn't going to be like five three, weeks, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh, it's just five weeks, it's fine. <laughs> um, little did we know. Little <laughs> did we know, yeah. I think, yeah, the narrative was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, so basically a year into COVID, if, we, if I can say it that way, I started having severe anxiety. I was like, well, what now? Initially, I think we were all so shocked by what's happening, but, but then everyone started finding their feet one way or another. And I didn't have the stuff that I've always defined myself by. Not, not I mean, in terms of career, right? From the age of 16, I was Katrain the model, but now I couldn't do modeling. For a year, I've been building this business, Coffee Met Katrain, which is about like hosting female um, events and stuff. So I couldn't have that. So who was I? And w what was I going to do? Suddenly, I was like, well, scrambling. What now? What now? And who am I? And I was having severe anxiety like I've never had before. And I, for the first time in my life, got like hectic anxiety attacks, the kind where you like, if this is gross, sorry, throw up on the floor, can't breathe. And I was very scared of that. I was like, I don't know what's happening. And anyone who's dealt with anxiety knows that it's kind of a weird thing, but the anxiety also makes you depressed. So I was crying a lot. I was very, I was in quite a dark space. And I think I was, initially I was quite in denial about it. And then one day my husband sat me down. He's like, listen, I don't know what's going on, um, but I want to help. So you either need to talk to me or go see someone or even if you just speak to a friend, but yeah, what, what's going on? Anyway, so from that discussion, I decided, well, I'm going to start going to therapy. And I also started taking anxiety medication, which best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> I'm still on it and I love it. Sliced medication. <laughs> yeah, sliced medication. <laughs> Don't even joke. I do have to slice them. I'm on half a tablet. Um, but so that's how I ended up going to therapy. And I remember my first session, uh, I said to her, listen, I think I'm having uh, a quarter life crisis. And I was like laughing. I was like, oh, I'm having a quarter life crisis. Ha 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 ha. And she just looked at me and she didn't say anything. And I s stopped laughing and I just started crying because as that joke was actually just the absolute truth, because it was exactly that, because suddenly this thing that I was defining myself by didn't have anymore. And um, it was quite scary for me to try and make way of that. Um, so I've been in therapy for two years now, and I absolutely love it. And one of the main things that I've learned from my time in therapy was the value of defining yourself outside of your roles. So outside of me being a model, outside of me being an entrepreneur, being a wife, being a friend, a daughter, a sister, and now a mother, if you take all of that away, who are you? Because that really is where the work is. 
because those things you can lose within a blink of an eye. And she actually had me write everything down. Who do I think I am? And it was so interesting because a lot of it was quite um, almost opposites. Like I am an introvert, but I also oh, I am an extrovert, but I also like being alone by myself. I um, like having these deep, thoughtful discussions, but I'm always up for like let's make a joke or having a fun time. So it was it was a very interesting. Those are just two examples, but it was a very interesting exercise and something I would really advocate anyone to do if you have the time um, to really just sit by yourself and think if you if you were to take away, again, your relationships and your roles in, in life, who are you? Um, what is the backdrop that you present yourself against? Um, that is something I, I still kind of work towards because it's continuously changing. You don't stay the same person. Do you, do you think that the the, the struggle with your identity as being a model was the biggest contributing factor to your burnout and not the hectic schedules, demands of uh, the pressure of the industry and stuff like that? It's both. Definitely having to be okay with I am a model because it is, first of all, I don't think something people consider a career, which is just bizarre and people have their own stereotypes about the industry and about models, which again is just bizarre. I, I can't tell you the kind of discussions I've had to had with people to defend myself. They were like, oh, you're actually quite smart for a model. And I'm like, well, thank you for that insult. Please elaborate. Um, so I, I did struggle to kind of take that as this is now my job and to take pride in it at that stage. Now I'm great, I'm fine with it. I'm like, I am a model and I'm actually quite a good one. And I work really hard for where I am now in my career. It doesn't just come your way. Yes, a great deal of it is luck, but it is also being, a, being willing to work hard, to be on set for hours, to, again, advocate for yourself often in sometimes tricky situations and going to castings and dealing with a lot of rejection. I don't think people realize that this industry is often 90% of the time rejection. If you go to 10 castings, you get one job, which means you get said no to nine times. So yes, that contributed to it, but then also again, just the physical burnout of living out of a suitcase and traveling and being by myself that much. I was just so lonely and so tired. How do you deal with rejection? Not well, mm. not well. Um, but again, my work has forced me to have a thick skin and I, I have to say, I've come a long way, but now I don't often take things personally. Even now, if I get rejection from a client or a casting, I'm like, okay, cool, it's fine. I, I'm absolutely okay removing myself from it. And I think maybe that comes back to the thing of who you are without your job, without your relationships. I, I'm not, I always say I'm not a model, I just do modeling. I'm not just that one thing. So if I do get rejection on like, oh, you're not what we're looking for, I'll be like, fine, I don't take it personally. In my personal life though, <laughs> different story. I would, I would probably struggle a little bit more because that is where I attach more value. So I think it's because I don't attach too much value to getting that job. I'm not saying I don't take pride in it, but in order for me to be okay with the reje rejection, I don't attach too much value to it. Although, again, in, in my personal life, it would be a little bit different because those would be the things that matter more. Isn't it interesting, I think, when we reach something like burnout or, or depression or a, a, a big change in our, in our uh, trajectory like that, we kind of rediscover ourselves, mm -hmm. one, where we, we, we knew ourselves before a certain age or before we started moving in a certain direction. And then it's almost like you have to rediscover who you actually are mm. based on how you grew up, how the, the, the stuff that our, uh, our parents imparted in, uh, in us, teachers imparted in us, um, leaders, mentors, um, had a big effect in how we, we were shaped. But I think as we move to a space of burnout or depression, all of that gets lost. We get so focused on whatever is the burden on us that we don't really 
recognize ourselves because that's what 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 m my biggest indication was like you said your husband as well um the people around you start to recognize that this isn't the person i got to know this isn't the person that i have come to love or um have seen flourish in their in their lives like you become a different version of yourself which we obviously don't like um but it's it's interesting to me how identity the same with me identity gets connected to you need to perform at a certain level you need yeah. to look at a certain way um, if you can say to young 16 17 year old Katrain something now that you wish you knew before you embarked on this journey what would it be before I answer your question I just want to say something um, yeah I think identity is such a big thing because that is what I really struggle with in this time that I had the severe anxiety was that identity thing. Who am I? Who am I? And that's the exercise of removing yourself from all those things. So who are you without that? And I always think you're a little bit like, a, um, you know, those crabs that shed their shells. You're very vulnerable. And you said that's when you kind of forget all the things. But I think or like that shaped you, but I think that's often a good time to actually go back to that, to think and re like look at things maybe a different way. Um, and that vulnerability is very uncomfortable because you have to sit with it before you can work to change whatever needs changing, whether and that's a mindset or circumstances. And you need to find yourself in a space where you're comfortable enough to deal with the facts. Because oh, no, it's <laughs> never going to be comfortable. It's never going to be comfortable. There's a lot of stuff that comes out there where you're like, hmm, this isn't nice to know about myself. Exactly, mm. but that's... It's, it's a beautiful thing, though. Like exactly, there's, yeah. there's so much growth and... And, and you and get addicted to that feeling, don't <laughs> you? Because that's why I keep going back to therapy. If I'm like, okay, cool, I'm seeing her next week. I'm like, oh, my word, I can't wait. Also, mm. let me make notes. So I go to my session, I'm like, listen. Da, 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 mm. She's like, can you calm down? <laughs> I'm like, no, but I need to talk about this and this and this. So I think once you find someone that you're comfortable to have in, in, in terms of a therapist that can help you just peel back the layers of yourself, then it's quite a beautiful thing because you do continue to learn. And the more you learn about, this, about yourself, you want to learn more. And then you, I can now feel the way that I look differently at things or respond differently to things because of what I learned about myself by going to therapy. Um, what was your question? Um, about young Katrain. But oh, I, yes. I just want to ask another question before we go there. Do you feel comfortable enough? We said now that if you're comfortable enough to have those conversations with people. Um, we found recently that we've been lucky enough to or fortunate enough to have a community that we the conversations have become a lot deeper in a casual Friday night braai or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not just about Bush to Yeah, like and, and tell me Formula a One. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's lit but it's literally like yeah. that. Sometimes there's, there's conversations that start off light and you can almost... Uh, we had a few of these conversations last year with, with some of our friends where you really dive deep into the stuff that actually really matters. And I find it super refreshing. I find it amazing to not just talk about rugby like... I wouldn't even hours. be able to talk about rugby, yeah, right? I'm yeah. like, what, they chase a ball? That sounds dumb. <laughs> um, I agree with you 100%. And I think, I think it's one of the good things that came out of the pandemic because people are starved for connection. And we can talk about rugby. Well, we can't, but people talk about rugby. Um, but it's never going to fill... Like, I'm not going to get to know you based on... What position? What positions, right? With the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, you played rugby in at school. Mm. But I do want to know what makes you tick, what gets you excited, what scares you. Um, because, and we spoke about this before um, coming onto the podcast, I think it's, it's just uh, that loneliness thing. We all have, in one way or another, we experience loneliness, whether it's in your workplace, whether it's me traveling the world at 16, or now being a new mom and you're doing the midnight feeds and you're by yourself, or you're an entrepreneur and there's a whole world that you need to navigate with circumstances that is uniquely yours. And with unique circumstances and unique experience comes loneliness. 
which is always a bad thing, mm. but it can be quite scary. Take us to your loneliest moment. Oh, I don't know you well enough. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, there have been several. There have been several. Um, the obvious would be traveling, literally traveling the world by myself. It's really not fun. And not even when times were tough, I was like, oh, I wish I had someone to support me in this. But also when things were really great and beautiful, I'll be like walking in New York with coffee in my hand and walking the High Line Park. And, and I want to turn to someone and say, how beautiful is this life? And there wasn't anyone even to share that. So there's that. I've experienced loneliness, like I said, now in, in COVID times with the loneliness that came with the anxiety that I had. Because anxiety can be very isolating because I feel like with anxiety, everyone's here and you're operating here. It's like, your mind is going like crazy and there's just no way to kind of make any sense of it, which is again where the medicine comes in, right? It just takes a little edge off so you can calm down enough to unscramble those crazy thoughts and then sort them out. So with that severe anxiety, loneliness, intense loneliness, I mean, it's also, again, the vulnerability thing. If you are on the floor, like your friends tell me, listen, when you're having, like, if you have an anxiety attack, call me. And you don't. You don't phone your friend when you're on the floor crying. I remember I'm a big dog person. I remember this, this one very intense anxiety attack that I had. I was on the floor, like, lying, and I couldn't get up, and I was, like, heaving, couldn't breathe. And my dog, she just came, and she put her head on mine and I was like well this is really cool I wish someone could see this <laughs> it was like it's such a beautiful moment yet I was feeling like shit. um so get a dog for loneliness just by the way um and then even loneliness now as a mom I think all new moms can relate to this it's a very no parent like no book parenting book no other person even I have an amazing supportive husband who's a full hands-on dad it's, it's very different if you're the mom because you are the default parent, especially like I am breastfeeding as well. So it's like you are the sole thing your baby needs to actually stay alive, which is beautiful and also very scary. <laughs> but you also experience loneliness in that because you also don't know what you're doing. Like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. I hope it's okay. Let's see if he lives. Um, so you experience loneliness in that and in the, the, the obvious things like at 2 a.m. in the morning and you awake, trying to get your baby back to sleep, very lonely. And it's lonely in the thoughts, like I said, am I doing this right? Is this okay? Is that okay? So, um, yeah, those I would say are three big things in my life where I've experienced loneliness. And I think... Loneliness is something, like I said before, we can all relate to in one way or another. It might look different for me than it does for you, but the actual loneliness would be this, but like it would boil down to the same thing. And in that, we would be able to find common ground when we talk about it around the braai. Do you believe uh, that social media adds to the loneliness? Yes. Yes and no, but more yes than no. If that makes sense. I think it does add to the loneliness because people tend to, what I've experienced when I've had lows is social media adds to my anxiety more than my loneliness. It is also a platform that can be used to meet people. I mean, I built my whole business, Coffee Met Katrine, around social media and I've met incredible people through social media, through Instagram. I only market it on Instagram. And I've met some of my best friends now through through that so it does have the opportunity to bring you to people and to a community whether it's a maybe book club or um, mom tribe kind of thing or it can I think it's more a contributor to anxiety than than loneliness although those two go hand in hand in in my experience I want to chat a little bit more about the the parenting in your life now but just before we get there let's return to our Young Katrain question. If you have oh to, yeah. if you have to say something to her now, that you've learned uh, over the last couple of years, what would that be? I would tell her, it's okay, and it's going to be okay. You, you don't have to have everything figured out. And I'm still often like that. Like I need to have everything figured out now. 
So I need to have controlled fun, <laughs> you know. I need to have everything sorted, but I've relaxed a little bit. But young Katang was quite pedantic in that sense. And I've, I needed routine, and it was an industry that doesn't have routine. I needed security that it was going to be okay, and I didn't have that. So I think if I could just tell her, just calm down a little bit. 2% would be great. It, it's going to be okay, because that, that would have allowed me to also maybe be more present and be able to then answer your question, what was that discussion like at the kitchen table? I was so hyper, again, maybe part of my anxiety, that I wasn't able to always be present. So if I could just tell myself, young Katrain, calm down, it, it's going to be okay. Try, at least try and enjoy this more, because it is a once-in-a-lifetime thing that happened, a one-in-a-million thing that happened to you. And now, like I said, now that I am in therapy and I am on a little bit of an anxiety um, medication, <laughs> yeah, love it, I, I've come to realize that I am just a clinically more anxious person. And it's also allowed for interesting discussions with my, my parents, especially my dad, and I don't think he would mind me sharing this, hopefully not, but he's also quite an anxious person. So it's, it's maybe just also part of my DNA. So I wish I was on an anxiety medication back then. So, but even, what's this now, 12 years ago, the language around something like that was different. It just shows you how fast things are changing. It's not just the past two years that's allowed us to have more meaningful, deep connections. But it has m maybe definitely fastened it, but even 12 years ago, I didn't have the language at 16 to say, I am anxious, I need help, right? Um, so that's a good thing. I think that the discussion is changing. I think a lot of young people now have better words for asking help. So young Katrin, I would say, it's okay, calm down, and maybe ask for help then. Just take the drugs, <laughs> not drugs. <laughs> take the anxiety let's, drugs. Let's yeah. cut that part yeah, out. <laughs> take the anxiety meds. Or ask for it at least. Yeah. Okay, fast forward back to to current life and, and when you started uh, Coffee with Katrain, like what was the premise? What what was burning inside of you? Um, like you said, you've you've been very passionate about being an advocate for women. Like what what happened within you to go to the point where you decided I'm going to be an entrepreneur, I'm going to stay um, establish Coffee with Katrain and be a, a space for women to connect. That was absolutely born out of my loneliness. I knew loneliness because I didn't have, because my, I, left my, I, I lost my school friends through the whole journey as we spoke about. And slowly but surely I started making friends and the value of friendship just meant so much to me because for so long I didn't have it. So I wanted to create a space where I knew other women would be able to connect with others. And also to share my story because all of these like heavy things we're talking about, there's also this, this like side story of, oh my God, I actually met Anna Wintour. I actually walked shows like Louis Vuitton. So there was these really cool fashion stories and experiences that I've had that I knew people wanted to know about. So it started with the idea of like doing motivational speaking and and... And I say that in big quotation marks because, because my idea was it's not necessarily going to motivate you. What is going to motivate you is meeting people from different walks of life, which again was a benefit that I've had or the beautiful thing that also came out of my experience as a young model at 16, traveling the world. So I wanted to create a space where, yes, I was going to share my story, but briefly, but that was really just the opening to opening the table. So yeah, it's your typical Frau Ochent or like a motivational speaking thing, but it was always at a table with maximum 12 guests. So it's super intimate. And the idea is for me to share my story, but really to open the table for people to talk to, to each other and to connect. So, and I was overwhelmed by, by the response people. Like women were so desperate to connect with each other and to whether or not they were comfortable sharing something but to just hear from someone else and to know that they are not alone kind of again the loneliness thing but 
she is not alone in her sadness and grief because the woman next to her shared a story that she's also experienced this. Or that woman shares her story of, um, of anxiety, for example, and now I feel less lonely about that. So it, yeah, people just really related to that in such a big and positive way. What are some of the conversations that come out at Coffee Mit Katrain? Like, obviously, uh, as seasons, uh, as we go into seasons, there's usually an underlying conversation around everybody's experiencing anxiety, everybody's experiencing this. What What is the average, let's say, between 24 and 28-year-old woman experiencing now? Um... I'm laughing because I keep saying this, but it's it's loneliness. It's just, and, and I've also experienced this in, I started another project in lockdown called Firio Frovius, where we have makeup artists and hairstylists and a photographer, and you the guest would book a ticket, and she gets her hair makeup done, and we take beautiful portraits. And that was born out of the idea that in my industry, that's a given. I get made up and take beautiful photos of on the daily almost. And it does boost your confidence to see yourself in that way. But in what other, under what other circumstances would other women have that opportunity? So anyway, so my friend and I, who's also in the industry, we decided we're going to do this thing to boost women's confidence, especially in lockdown. And you would not believe how the peop- the woman would get so emotional. It, the one woman was in her 40s, and she went, when they... When we showed her the photos, she started crying. She's like, the last time she had her hair and makeup done was at her wedding, which was like 30 years ago. Well, if she's 40, no, it was like 20 years ago. Math. Um, so we, ex- we, we, and we, every time after Fidia Faroes, we see the loneliness thing again. And I saw that at Kofi Mekatrain as well. We just want to connect with people and also just meet new people because also we as adults do, we make friends, right? It's in school, in university, that's easy, it's fine. It's because of proximity you meet new people. Or in the workspace, because of proximity you meet new people, eventually you talk, water cooler gossip turns into wine, turns into friendship. But people are desperate to, to make friends and to have those meaningful conversations. What do you think is the antidote to loneliness? What should happen in the world for us to become less lonely? Because obviously this is a pandemic if it, if it comes out in so many different shapes and forms. And we can even, from a, from a, from a man conversation, like there's, there's, there's also the loneliness there in terms of how you perceive yourselves in relation to others and, and all kinds of things. Um, but I think if there's a conversation this big that comes out this frequent and is experienced by so many people, then I think there must be something done or we must try and... Uh, like counter the result um, of that just growing and growing and growing. So what in your mind would be the the antidote to a loneliness culture? I don't have an answer for you. I think it would be... Hmm. Yeah? In my mind, I think that if we get off of our phones a little bit more, mm. and if we go and hike a little bit more, because like you said, where do we, where do we? How um, how many people do you think is on the mountain? <laughs> so how's that going to help anyone? <laughs> It'll just be you. <laughs> like eighty people, maybe. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, but like I think we we should create moments that we can actually meet people. We we can't sit sit yeah. at home, at, uh, at our couch or spend three and a half hours on screen time mm. or spend our evenings running through Netflix, um, uh, the, the timeline on Netflix. We need mm. to find a, a space or, or moments where we can actually create the opportunity to meet people, create the opportunity to express and experience ourselves yeah. in community and in relationship to other people. For sure. But I think what people are scared of is the vulnerability that comes with having to put yourself out there. Because if you want to join a high club, you have to make yourself vulnerable. You have to actually show up. And that scares people. So I, abs- I agree you have to put yourself out there, but that's easier said than done. It's, yeah, I think people are scared of that vulnerability, of the, re- of the possibility of rejection. So the, the, the easy answer would be join a club. 
it's it's a very layered thing of like, what if they don't like me? How do I approach someone? Um, but I agree with you. It would be it would be going out literally outside, just walk in your just walk in your neighborhood. You'll meet you'll see someone and just. Well, that'll be weird, but you know <laughs> what I'm saying, right? Trying, trying to to put yourself out there, whether that's um, even with colleagues at work, try and in, and move a work friendship to somewhere else, a different setting where perhaps then you would connect with someone on a different level. Or if you do join a high club, make the effort. If you know it's going to be hard and difficult, but make the effort to do the casual small talk about rugby. You know, just as a little bit of a, a taster, and then you never know, you, you might just make a friend for life. Mm. Tell us uh, about being a mom. Like, what does that do to your soul? Like, what was the picture that you had before becoming a mom and then now being a mom? What did it look like, and how, how has that experience been for you? It's been the most amazing experience. The, one of my favorite podcasts, they, they, they call something beautiful, like brutally beautiful. And I think that is absolutely parenthood summed up because it's so brutal in so many ways. It's the vulnerability that comes with being a parent because now there's this tiny human that I created and who I would die for and I have to send him out into the world. And what if something happens to him? <laughs> but it's also the most beautiful thing because... He's now started crawling, for example, and he's fascinated by the smallest things. So, in a way, my world's smaller because it now revolves around naps and feeding and teaching him fine motor skills. You don't know how excited I get about putting stickers on the wall and having him pull it off. But it's also infinitely bigger because he's just enriched everything and learning to enjoy and rediscover the small things through his eyes and seeing his little personality come through. I mean, he's only seven, almost eight months, so he's barely human, but he's, yeah, it, it, it kind of takes you back to what is important above all else, regardless of my career, of materialistic things like house, um, money, all that matters is him. So motherhood has really put things in a different, beautiful, beautiful perspective. That's what really matters. And is it what I expected it to be? Yes and no. Um, it's, I thought it would change me more, but it softened me into myself a little bit. I... My edges aren't as sharp. I, I've really softened into who I am. And I, maybe that again comes with the perspective thing that he brings. Or, um, yeah, so, and on a practical level, it's, it is what I thought it was going to be. It's a lot of diapers. <laughs> Just a lot. Yeah, no one prepares you for that. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience. And, it's, a, it's continuously having to look at yourself because as we spoke earlier about how your childhood already informs the rest of your life, um, I am already informing who he's gonna be. And that is a massive responsibility, but also something quite exciting that I get to, in a way, within context, within reason, shape this little human, but then also see him and what he's going to do out in the world one day. Mm. What is your dream for Christian? What do you want to see him become, or what do you want to see him experience? I just want him to be happy, whatever that looks like, to be happy and to be comfortable in himself, which is asking a lot <laughs> for of the little guy, right? But to, like I said, I, I think he, what I've had the past two years with, getting to know myself more through therapy and being that vulnerable with anxiety and, 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 and in our motherhood, I've really softened and settled into myself more, which is a gift that comes with growing older, right? I want that for him as well, just that being comfortable in your own skin, 
and being comfortable with who you are and just happy, whatever that looks like for you. If that is the normal thing or if that's the abnormal thing going against what everyone else does, that's fine. Just, just be happy and healthy, please. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that um, that Sohia is is involved and is 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 doing his daddy duties. Um, tell us about how th- that the effects of parenthood shapes relationships with with Sohia, but also with with grandpa and grandma. Like obviously, th- there's a there's a lot that's happening in your life, but also to see grandpa and grandma play with your little one for the first time that mm. must be that must do something within you. It Christian's brought a lot of healing in my relationship with my parents because it it's been quite layered with what i experienced and leaving school and all of that um and my parents and i've put a lot of work in in our relationship the last few years but then christians has come and and shown us how unifying love can be, I mean, that's so cliche, but it's so true. He's really, um, he, he's, he's done, yeah, without him knowing, I didn't want to put that on him, right? But just he's, us all having this tiny human that we all love so much is very healing. And it's a wonderful thing to see other people love your child. No one prepares you for that. Everyone's like, oh, you're going to love your child. No one's, you, you're not going to know love like that. And that is true, but it's extremely, extremely heartwarming to see your people, or in my case, my people, my people love my child, whether that's my parents, my parents-in-law, my friends. It's beautiful because it is that thing about it takes a village to not just raise a child, but to, to help a mother and help a father and help them in their marriage. And help this little human who who's now navigating a really difficult world but he has a bigger support system than I ever I mean you think of a support system as your immediate family your parents but if I just look at my friends for example loving him it's it's quite yeah quite beautiful and with Celia with Celia I mean I just love seeing him as a dad and he yeah, he's very he's he's very funny as well. I mean, we have a great. I think Celia and I have a great sense of humor within our marriage. We we always do things like it's it's fun. And same with parenting, we would like look at Christian and like, you're new here. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is how we do things in this house. Please get with the program, kind of thing. Um, a baby does change your marriage quite a lot. Uh, so there's there's definitely been growing pains in that, but. It's also very beautiful to to have something that the two of you created and that you're just so excited to to nurture and love and pour into. Um, so yeah, I, n- I know the two of them are having a great time at home right now. <laughs> yeah, most likely throwing balls and playing guitar. Christian's obsessed with Celia's guitar, so he just wants to bang on it. So future musician are growing there. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> Well, hopefully not. I don't think my ears will be able to hold it, but <laughs> yeah. What, um, what does the next season of your life look like? What are you excited about? What are you passionate about? Um, what are you going to um, put your hands on? I am excited to just be present in this season, at least for now. I love being a mom, and I can see myself. We've got a few more kids. Which is also like five unic- and counting. Five <laughs> and counting, um, which is not what I expected. Again, just back to your previous question, I didn't expect I'm going to love it this much. So I like give me five to ten kids, I will start my own rugby team. Watch us <laughs> at the Bry now. But so I think next season would just be, um, yeah, settling into settling into to parenthood. Whether that's one, two, three, four, five, six kids. No, I'm just joking, but. But several kids, I hope to still work. I'm not, I don't travel for work anymore, um, just for like obvious reasons, but to make the most of my career here in Cape Town um, and balancing that with being a mom. 
and to also see how coffee maker train would grow and evolve whether that would include moving more to a mom parent kind of way or um, yeah but that the beautiful thing about coffee maker train is it kind of can adapt to what people want or what what my audience on instagram feed like gives me feedback on so yeah and i think it's at the moment it's kind of just a balancing thing doing all those things um and figuring all that out while raising a a tiny human what is your biggest challenge now making all that work while raising (laughs) a tiny (laughs) human i have to say often it's like i i don't know how i'm going to get to everything and then somehow you do you just yeah i would say just all the different hats that one needs to put on and then also like do the cooking right but just my biggest challenge now is finding time to do everything the way i wanted to but then again it's also maybe a bit of exercise of letting go slightly a little bit it's okay if my house isn't pristinely clean or if I don't answer all the emails tonight because there's only so much that you can do. So my biggest challenge is just trying to do it all but then also allowing myself to not do it all because I want to do it all the way I should. And yeah. We have a closing tradition on this podcast. Okay, I'm scared. We're, no, don't be. Uh, okay, maybe a little. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, where we ask you quick fire questions. Okay. So the first thing that pops up in your mind. Okay. It could be dangerous. So <laughs> yeah. Watch yourself. <laughs> yeah. This Filter is going on. public. <laughs> yeah. Um, what book are you currently reading? Tuesdays with Maureen. Favorite um, food? Pizza. That's easy. Go to happy song. Anything Taylor Swift. Like I how knew you were going to say how that. How are we at the <laughs> end of the podcast and I haven't spoken about Taylor Swift yet? <laughs> right. Anything? Would you like to have a moment? I would. How much time do you have? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, anything Taylor Swift. I'm such a big Swiftie. It's not even funny. Favorite wine? A- as in color, right? No, wine. Wine. Oh, yeah, like brand, Red color, wi- whatever. Yeah. Oh. Um, Merlot, Cab Sav, whatever. Mm, anything, really. <laughs> anything Just with alcohol. Anything <laughs> that gets the job done. <laughs> Pet peeve. So many. Lack of table manners. Don't get me started. No, you're fine. Okay. No, yeah. <laughs> Lack of table manners. I'm so... Anyways, moving on. Yeah. Bradley Cooper or Ryan Reynolds? Neither. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Seer of Boss Vacancy? Ah. I like both, but I'm going to have to say Seer just because of the nostalgia attached Hope to it. Boss, yeah. yeah. Although I do love a little bit of Kriervoltein. Like, mm. give me an elephant. I cry often when I see an elephant. <laughs> it sounds like I see elephants often. I don't mean it that way. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, scrap all that. <laughs> Last question. Where would you like to travel next? Hmm. It's going to be a bit of a cliche, but my sister-in-law and her family moved to Singapore, so I would have to say Singapore. Mm. Mm. That was actually the second last question. There's one more coming. Okay, so um, it, it scrolls yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, complete the sentence. I feel that I'm flourishing in life when? When, at the end of the day, I felt I was 100% authentic in everything that I did. Katrine, thank you very much for inviting us into your story and for sharing about your life. Uh, I appreciate from the moment I met you a couple of years ago. That's um, many years now. Right? <laughs> it's many years yeah, ago. Yeah, it's many years. I mean. Um, I've appreciated your vulnerability, your authenticity, um, your humbleness and just in the way that you conduct yourself. And it was, if for me personally, very exciting to see you w- grow and and hear testimonies of the people's life that you've changed through Coffee with Katrain. Mm-hmm. And to watch your comments, the, the stuff that you or the, the stuff that you do on social media and see how people respond to the amazing work that you do. And I hope you continue with that. Um, it's been a great testimony of, of what you do. And I truly thank you for your time and spending it with us. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. It was really great. Um, I hope to be back soon. Hopefully. Yeah. Season two. Season two. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> just invite me back and then just please allocate time for me to talk about Taylor Swift.
To follow Katrain's journey of motherhood, modeling and motivational speaking, you can find her on Instagram and YouTube at Katrain Creer. Thanks for listening to the Framework to Flourish podcast, hosted by Marco Hasbrook and produced in collaboration with Imagine This. For today's episode, Stefani de Toy was our coordinator, John Rehoog, our technical producer, with Lian Smith as the technical assistant, and Karina Kloppers, our content producer. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn at Flourish Workshops to stay up to date with our latest episodes, workshops, and retreats. Until next time, keep going and growing.